for the, the introduction. Um, yeah, Dimitri didn't give the full name of what I was at at Stanford, which is the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. So as an exoplanet person, I was kind of a, a odd fit. I basically told them they should think of exoplanets as like 10 to the 53 electron volt dark matter particles. But after nine years, they kind of figured that out, and it was time to, you know, being at KaiPak was actually an amazing experience. I am now in a new, extremely exciting job. This is the first talk I have given. I've had the new, extremely exciting job for a month, and so today was the day of going through and trying to replace all the Stanford logos, which I clearly, there we go, um, uh, mostly succeeded on um, through the talk. Um, but of course, what I'm really representing is not my institution, but the work of a large, extraordinarily talented collaboration, a small subset of which, the people who contributed like, directly to things that show up in slides, are um, um, listed here. So, and as Dimitri said, and of course you're familiar from the astonishingly good his work, his work his group does, I'm going to talk about direct imaging of extrasolar planets. So let's see if this video behaves itself. Yeah, it should. So um, I like to date the direct imaging field back to about 1610, um, when Galileo first looked through his telescope. And one of the first things he looked at was Jupiter. And one of the first things he noticed was that next to Jupiter, there were these four little dots. And then he looked back on the next night. He, maybe they were background stars, but he looked on the next night and the next night and the next night after that, saw the same four little dots, and realized rapidly that they were co-moving with Jupiter, that they were real bound objects, that they had their own independent orbits, and we now know of them as the, the Galilean satellites. That was part of the whole revolution that led to a heliocentric rather than a geocentric model. From a scientist standpoint, of course, what was compelling about that transition was Kepler's successful producing a, an ability to predict the positions of planets, was actually having an astrophysical model that, that underlaid it, and was what, essentially an indirect confirmation. Mars moves as if it moves around the sun. Indirect in exoplanets is very important, but there's also something compelling about direct, about you actually look through a telescope and you see little faint dots orbiting around a bright thing um, uh, in the center of your image, and you realize that you're seeing real objects. And it may not be coincidental that it was that, rather than Kepler's math, that got the church authorities mad enough to lock someone up. Um, it was also that Galileo was a jerk, and Kepler was much more quiet and polite and in a different part of Europe and so on. So it's a bad sign when scientists compare themselves to Galileo, so I probably won't do that. But um, there is something astonishing. I mean, there, I'll talk about the science we get from direct imaging, the reason it's a probe's unique exoplanet phase space. But actually being able to look at an image, like this movie of HR 799 from Keck, and to see planets moving, to realize that the universe moves, that these objects are real out there, is kind of one of the most astonishing moments that, that I've had um, as a, a scientist. And nobody's locked me up, so, yet. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about direct imaging, kind of why we want to do it, why it's hard. There's been a huge amount of work, including really brilliant stuff by, at Keck with um, KPIC by, by Dimitri's group, work that Jean-Baptiste Rufio, who just left here, has done with OSIRIS. But I'm mostly going to talk about the Gemini Planet Imager, the GPI Exoplanet Science Campaign, and then our plans for upgrading um, GPI into an instrument that we're unimaginatively calling GPI-2. This is a figure we made for the decadal survey of exoplanets as of, of 2010, um, as of the previous decadal survey. And by then, there were a lot of them detected through a wide variety of methods. Of course, by 2020, there was an astonishingly large amount of them. Um, we know a lot now about the demographics of planets kind of in here, and that has informed our thinking about planet formation and planet evolution. But you can also see from these diagrams the limits of different techniques, like radial velocity measurements and transit measurements, and that there's a whole range of planet properties, planet semi-major axis and mass that is probed only by direct imaging. And so extending and continuing to complete the, the census, the number of planets in outer parts of solar systems, for now is something that's only really accessible to direct imaging. Microlensing with, with um, Nancy Grace Roman will will fill in a huge amount of this. But objective one of direct imaging is really just understanding are planets common on 100 AU orbits? Are multi-Jupiter mass planets common at scales that we can't probe with radial velocity or other techniques? 
The second thing that direct imaging is good for is seeing what the planets are made out of. Why would you want to care what the planets are made out of? Well, they're mostly made out of hydrogen because we're seeing giant planets. But things like their metallicity are tracers of the process that formed the planet. This, for example, is Jupiter. The ratio of the abundance of elements compared to the sun, essentially metallicity if you're an astronomer, for Jupiter, for almost every element is about three. It was kind of mismeasured for oxygen for various reasons, but the Juno measurement confirms that it's about three. And that's a clue as to how Jupiter formed. It says Jupiter preferentially accreted metals. The only way to do that is to preferentially accrete solid material. So the process that formed Jupiter involved adding a lot of solid material. In even more detail, things like the carbon to oxygen ratio tell you what kind of solid material got accreted essentially a uniform sample of, of if you took this protosolar nebula and froze it, a few percent of Jupiter's mass comes out of that, and that tells you something about where Jupiter might have formed. Different parts of a planet-forming disk will have different metallicities and different C to O ratios as individual elements freeze in and out. Just toy model of a planet. So the composition of a planet, its C to O ratio, its metallicity, traces what was going on where it formed no matter where you see it later on. And so trying to measure the metallicity of planets can help tell you something about their formation process. And I could say that you can't see that I can't completely say that with a straight face because I'm wearing a mask. Even though we've dropped a damn probe into Jupiter, we don't understand how Jupiter formed, but we know something about it from measurements like this. Transit spectroscopy, of course, can measure metallicities. And so a large number of transiting planets have had metallicity measurements. This is a graph from a couple of years ago showing trends in our solar system and among the transiting planets. There's a rough trend that connects metallicity with mass in a way that might make sense if you have a finite amount of solid material. But in our solar system, you can't tell if that trend also involves separation from the sun or not. You only, mass and separation from the sun are correlated. In transiting planets, you also can't tell that because you're only probing a very small sample of planets extremely close to their star that are almost certainly a long way from where they formed in the first place. And so the ability to probe a new set sample of planets to get their metallicities, again, will help constrain planet formation. This is the same figure of all the known extrasolar planets um, uh, using, database fr using excuse me, data from the NASA Exoplanet Encyclopedia, to credit appropriately. Um, these are the ones for which you can credibly say anything that resembles spectroscopy or even photometry has ever happened. And it's a much smaller sample of planets. The heavily shaded ones are now the ones that have been characterized. If you just count planets, direct imaging pathetic. We found many, many, many fewer than the transiting planets. If you actually count ones we've measured composition of, or let alone really good spectra, it's an important piece of probing spectroscopic phase space. And then reason three we're doing direct imaging of giant planets now is that it's part of the path towards doing the same measurements for Earths. I'll show you spectra of giant planets that we've made with advanced coronagraphs and advanced integral field spectrographs. 20 years from now, someone who's not me, but probably is Dimitri, will give a talk showing the same measurements for a planet like an Earth, where the individual lines are not carbon monoxide, but they're oxygen. This is a simulation of what such a spectrum might look like. And so learning to do this now on the Jupiters is part of how we're going to get to the Earths 20 years from now. All right, why aren't we doing it all the time? Um, it's really hard. So I'll show several versions of plots like this. The y-axis is contrast, which is an ill-defined term, but in the way I'm using it here is the ratio, the flux ratio, the ratio of the brightness of a planet to its parent star. And then the x-axis is separation in arc seconds for a copy of our solar system at five parsecs. And what you can see is all the planets in our solar system are at 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10, or even lower levels of contrast, very faint compared to the sun. Um, OK, but how faint is too faint? That's just 10 to 10 sounds like a big number. But um, for comparison, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image um, showing the performance of sort of state-of-the-art coronagraphs 25 years ago. There's a star occulted behind a focal plane mask for a coronagraph. This is a little ghost that is at about 10 to the 4. So it's 10 to the 5 times brighter than Jupiter would be in an equivalent image. And for a near, typical nearby star, it's at the equivalent of 50 AU, 10 times greater separation. So instruments like Hubble are nowhere near the ability you would need to see a planet like Jupiter. Why not? Light comes from about 80 different things. There's diffraction from the telescope spiders. 
There's the concentric airy pattern from the fact that your telescope has a finite size. And then there's little lumps all over the place, in this case from polishing errors in the, the Hubble telescope primary mirror, all of which completely swamp the signal from a hypothetical planet. And if I put that on this graph, Hubble performance is somewhere up here, a long way from Jupiter. This sensitivity floor here is mostly set by things like wavefront errors, roughly proportional to wavefront error squared. And then this sensitivity cutoff here, the smallest angle you can see a planet at, is roughly set by the design of your coronagraph and the size of your telescope, some scaling factor times lambda over the diameter of the telescope. Not a lot of planets up there. Keck actually, even in early AO days, did substantially better than that, especially as we develop better image processing. So Keck sensitivity is kind of up here, still a long way from Jupiter. And so the trick, as I'm sure you're familiar with from people, people talking about it here, is we look for planets that are brighter than Jupiter. You could look for a planet that's like 100 times bigger in radius than Jupiter, but the universe doesn't make planets like that. Instead, you look for planets that are thousands of times brighter than Jupiter because they're young. We don't understand planet formation, but well, I used to say it because I'm a physicist. I'm no longer a physicist. I'm an astronomer again. But as of, a week, as of two months ago, I was a physicist. We do understand the initial conditions of planet formation, big cloud of gas. We understand the final conditions, planet. One thing that changes between those two is gravitational potential energy. When you turn a big cloud of gas into a planet, a lot of energy is released. And if a significant fraction of that stays with the planet, which you might expect it to be, the planet will be hot when it forms and then it will cool down. This is from one of the first papers pointing this out by Adam Burroughs. It's a graph of luminosity in solar units, which you could think of as analogous to the contrast I was showing, versus age in giga years for planets from 15 down to one Jupiter masses. Jupiter lives here, 10 to the minus nine, five giga years age, but when Jupiter was young, like 10 million years old, it was only 10 to the minus six times fainter than the sun. And because the gravitational potential energy has a nice mass squared scaling, planets that are even a little bit more massive than Jupiter will be substantially brighter. So the trick to finding planets is to look for it with the technology we have now is to look for them when they're young and relatively massive. These are now 30 million year old, two to five Jupiter mass planets plop down, they'd be detectable with um, uh, current adaptive optics. And in fact, they were detected with current adaptive optics. This is the same system I showed the movie of before, HR 8799, the, the four planet system that Christian Marois and myself discovered in 2008 through 2010. Every dot, an actual planet. Here's the star, partially blocked by a coronagraph. Not perfectly, so there's lots of little speckly lights, but planets, 1,000 Kelvin objects with masses of three to five Jupiter masses. But, all right, so we can see maybe three Jupiter masses or five Jupiter masses. Turns out these guys are at sort of 40 AU kind of scales. We're still not getting into analogs of our solar system. Why can't we do better? We're still limited by now um, the same fundamental processes as Hubble, the wavefront errors the, that scatter light. This kind of inner edge of sensitivity, which I've just drawn as a cartoon straight line, is limited by how good the adaptive optic system is, how well it can correct atmospheric turbulence, and a little bit by how good your coronagraph is. The coronagraphs we had back then were not especially good. And then out here, there's a sensitivity floor from the sky background, and again, from how good your adaptive optic system is that was limiting us to kind of five Jupiter mass class objects with Keck, depending on the separation and the age of the target. I assume people are allowed to ask questions in line, or? I'm terrible about the whole question thing. So why don't I pause for a moment and take a question? Yes? Yes, the extremely good point. Oh, sorry. The question was, contrast is defined for some particular wavelength, which I did not actually write down on the slide. I did not write it down because I'm kind of blurring the visible light -like contrast of these planets um, with these planets. I'm actually writing down their H-band or near-infrared contrast, which is a traditional sleight of hand done in our field. If I did it all at H-band, Jupiter and Saturn would actually look worse. They would drop. Um, uh, um, or if I did it L-band, these guys would move up a little bit. You know, there's a factor of 10 differences on wavelength, but this is a figure that spans eight orders of magnitude, so I was willing to be sloppy about it. But thank you for, for asking that question, though. Other questions? All right. So 
Um, pretty happy with how we did on Keck. We found some planets. We wanted to do better. Um, and that led to asking ourselves, how could we do better in here where planets are really interesting? How could we do better further out? Um, and that process led to the design of the Gemini Planet Imager. So it was designed to look at these young stars. Nobody asked me what counts as young, but young for our target sample was sort of 10 to 300 million years. 10 because if you're looking for stars younger than 10 million years, you're looking pretty far away. 300 because the planets have gotten pretty faint by then. Within 50 parsecs, eventually we softened that to 100 parsecs for some stars. Sensitive to planets that form hot with lots of potential energy above maybe three Jupiter masses. And in the process of designing GPI, um, James McBride, James Graham, others did very detailed simulations of a survey that said, let us set instrument parameters. For example, because we're only targeting out to 50 parsecs, a magnitude limit of, eight, of eighth magnitude for the AO system was considered acceptable. Because we're targeting relatively out to 50 parsecs, 10 AU gives you an inner working angle of 0.2 arc seconds. To get enough planets, we wanted to target a contrast of 10 to the 7, substantially better than we were doing at Keck. Contrast will vary with separation, so that's at about half an arc second, corresponding to maybe a Jupiter mass at 25 AU. H -bit, from the models we had at the time, J-band and H-band looked like the most important wavelengths, Y-band and K-band kind of auxiliaries. And when we feed these instrument parameters through an instrument model into a simulation, we said, well, if we look at 1,000 stars in the solar neighborhood, we might find 30 planets or so. And we did a lot of tuning to maximize the number of planets per dollar. And that led to the design for the Gemini Planet Imager. It was built by a large collaboration. Um, uh, led by Lawrence Livermore National Lab, who also built the adaptive optics system. The coronagraph masks were from Rebecca Oppenheimer's group at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, the infrared integral field spectrograph was a joint effort between UCLA and University of Montreal. The mechanical structure and the mid-level software that connects it was the Hertzberg Institute in Canada. Um, and then the data pipeline, which I'll return to later, extremely important, done by Montreal University of Toronto and Space Telescope Science Institute. And as a footnote, we put a lot of work into making everything really good. For example, we made sure every mirror in the system was super polished to make our lives easier downstream. I could fill up a whole talk with all the engineering details. That's not this talk. Um, so skipping over the engineering, um, we got first light for the instrument in November 2013. It lives, if you're a Gemini connoisseur, this is Gemini South in Chile. Why is that? The stars we want to look at, the stars that are between 10 and, say, 100 million years, happen to be preferentially in the southern hemisphere. The star formation history of our neighborhood of the galaxy has had several recent episodes creating these young associations or young moving groups, many of which have been discovered or characterized by people here that about two-thirds of them are southern hemisphere rather than northern hemisphere objects. So we went to Gemini South. There are mixed consequences of that that I'll return to when I talk about lessons learned from the survey. But whatever you say about it as a site, Gemini South is beautiful. There's GPI bolted on the back of the telescope, um, 2,200 kilograms of adaptive optics and computers and, and stuff like that. And again, I can talk about the technology forever afterwards if people are interested in technology. Um, in our first light run, we actually had a couple of nights where we're just allowed to look at calibration stars, and then the project manager went to sleep, and we decided to look at a planet for a change. Um, we pointed at Beta Pictoris b, which was a known directly imaged exoplanet. You'll probably see several GPI images, and so what you're seeing here is GPI's coronagraph mask, the focal plane stop that gets rid of starlight, and then glinting around the edge of it related to the optical design of the coronagraph. You're seeing here four copies of the star that are produced by diffraction for calibration purposes. You're seeing a few speckles, but here you're seeing something real, which is the actual Beta Pic B planet. For comparison, here's an, an image from a previous generation instrument, the sort of Gemini equivalent of NERC-2 called Nikki. Planet is detectable, but you kind of need to know where to look. In addition, that Nikki image took about 3,952 seconds of telescope time and the GPI image took about 60 seconds of telescope time. So from the moment we started it, its performance was, was substantially better than state of the art, especially close to the star. So the GPI contrast curve kind of looks like this, digging out a pretty significant bite on, inner solar, on not inner solar system scales, but substantially closer to um, uh, the star than we previously could do. 
Again, pause for a second if there are GPI hardware related questions. Um, or I figure my management skills are gonna to need to include stopping to let other people talk, which is not, not one of my best habits. Um, again, skipping over the commissioning process. In addition to building the instrument, Gem and I had a competition for a large program to carry out a survey. Our team was selected to do that survey. The plan was to target about 600 stars with ages between eight and 300 million years. Here's a scatter plot, in this case, spectral type versus distance and color coded for age. You can see, for example, when stars are nearby, we're willing to observe them if they're a little older and we can get a broader range of spectral types. When stars are far away, because of that eighth, eighth to ninth magnitude cutoff, they have to be relatively bright, early type stars, and they're only worth looking at if they're very young. And again, that's a theme I'll return to later as I talked about GPI-2. We were targeting 600 stars. We ended up with 532 um, as the weather wasn't stunning. We spent about an hour on every star. We got very good spectra of 10 planets and brown dwarfs, and we looked at a lot of um, disks, which I won't talk about significantly in this talk, but I would encourage you to invite Paul Kalis or Tom Esposito or Marshall Perrin to talk about disks um, at length. We had a large collaborative science team. This was our last major science team at um, UC San Diego. It was a privilege to, to work with all of these people and, and watch them um, grow up as we, as we concluded the instrument. Um, GPI is a pretty good AO system, um, actually not quite as good as our, as our VLT counterpart sphere, very good spectrograph, very good coronagraph. The thing actually that was absolutely the best about GPI compared to the competition was the data pipeline. So from the moment we were on the telescope, we actually could produce that image I showed you of, of beta pic B in real time while we were there at the telescope although we didn't have north right, so I was holding my laptop up sideways to try and decide which one was beta pic B. But other than not getting north right, the pipeline was working on night one. By the middle of the survey, the pipeline was fully automated to the point where data gets taken, gets logged in a database, both the actual data, but also metadata, like observatory temperatures or weather indicators or positions of mechanisms stored in an archive, which is on Dropbox for embarrassing historical reasons, and then goes through something called the data cruncher that Jason Wang, who also was just um, at this institution, put together. And then the data cruncher does medium quick looks that get dropped into Slack, and so you literally get a Slack image saying, yeah, maybe there's a planet, and contrast curves. You get real-time images where over the course of, a, of the hour you can see a signal building up, in this case a debris disk. Everything gets logged so people can do stuff with it gets automatically archived in the wiki. And then later we do reprocessings more carefully um, with optimized instrument parameters. So at the end of the whole survey, so we had the ability to identify targets in real time, which did turn out to be very powerful for characterization and understanding things that were going on. And at the end of the survey, we have this massive archive where we know the sensitivity and we connect it to properties of the stars like ages or to things like what the temperature in the observatory was at that time. We saw a lot of disks. Again, I'm not gonna talk about them except that they're pretty. So this, for people who aren't used to these, these are pictures mostly of what we call debris disks. A debris disk is something around a medium young star, 10 to a few hundred million years. It's not a planet forming disk. That star is done forming its planets, but it's full of crap that's left over after you form a planet like asteroids and comets that are colliding with each other and producing dust particles. And in fact, in a typical one of these systems has about 10,000 times as much dust as our solar system does because it hasn't settled down into that more stable um, state. Um, and you should remember that number. It might show up later on in a surprising context. Um, so they're beautiful and, and almost every one of these has had an individual paper. We have spectra and polarimetry of them and Tom wrote a very nice survey article about correlations between this and age, between this and the presence of planets and so on but planets. So our models, 30 planets, we got six. Um, and across here, and then four brown dwarfs across here. In addition, of course, several of these were previously known planetary objects. We're allowed to count them for statistical purposes because we assembled our target database blind, honestly, not crossing fingers or anything like that. Um, but the number of new planet discoveries was not what we predicted. Partially that's because, of course, we got so good at using Keck that we found some of these planets before GPI came along. I don't feel bad about that. But partially also it's reflecting something about the universe, which I'll return to in a little bit. 
Still six planets, four brown dwarfs, pretty good. We have spectra of all of these. Um, these have only been published, only a subset of them have been published and mostly in individual papers. From the hottest object to the coolest object, here's all of their spectra. For comparison, here's an archive of HST spectra from a paper by Singh et al. from about six years ago. Um, you know, every spectra is beautiful. Um, they're probably, it's easier to access interesting features at these wavelengths around planets of these temperatures. Um, and this is about 1,000 hours of HST time. Um, this spectral library is more like about 50 hours of ground-based telescope time. So it actually does have the ability to characterize planets. What we don't have, of course, is any more planets to characterize. This kind of exhausts the list. But you can get good spectra of these. And then other groups are doing beautiful stuff with high-resolution spectra. Direct imaging actually really has produced, I would still say, the best spectra of extrasolar planets. I'm weighing the two JWST papers in my head as I say that, but, but among the best. We did get one new planet, um, 51 Eridani b. So it's orbiting a star that's about 23 million years old, part of the same group of stars as Beta Pictoris. A little bit more massive than the sun, 1.5 solar masses, somewhere around F0 or so. The planet is 2 to 10 Jupiter masses, and the uncertainty depends on things that we can't currently measure, like the planet's initial conditions. I said planets are hot. How hot depends on the details of how they form on how much of that potential energy is retained by the planet versus how much is radiated away in a shock, for example. Um, no matter how you slice it, it is the, the coolest planet that we've that's been routinely imaged or spectroscopically characterized of all the ones out there. From the publication paper, these are spectra. The things with the error bars are the g pi spectra of the planet. Um, the line down here is Jupiter. And so this is a spectrum that if you'd actually gone and showed it to like Kuiper or somebody 50 years ago and said, what was this? He would have said, this is a planet. It shows strong methane absorption, strong water, strong carbon monoxide, looks planety. If you showed it to somebody 20 years ago, they'd say it's a brown dwarf, but um, still, still fairly planety. Um, and then we don't want to just, just count them and, and um, measure spectra. We want to characterize the planets. And so we've done a lot of work with modeling these, work by Mark Marley, Caroline Morley, Travis Barman, to fit to GPI models. This is a model set from about three years ago by Abhi Rajan. And both GPI data and then some longer wavelength photometry from Keck. This model, for example, you can see does OK, except it fails spectacularly at hitting the, the Keck photometry. There's the model. There's the average of the model over the same wave band as that Keck photometric point, misses it by a mile. In addition, although th this model produces a temperature of 900 Kelvin, might be reasonable, might not be reasonable, solar metallicity kind of okay, it predicts a radius for the planet of half a Jupiter radius. And that's physically impossible. You cannot make a multi-Jupiter mass object have a radius of half a Jupiter radius unless it's a lot of it is made out of rock, for example. Yeah. There's a lot we don't understand about planet modeling. We understand the equation of state of hydrogen well enough to say that that's um, impossible. What does that mean is wrong? There's the highlight of the bit that's impossible. It's the details of the model fitting of the atmosphere. That number is derived from kind of the same place as the effective temperature. You could think of it that we kind of know the luminosity of the planet because we've measured it at a lot of wavelengths. Um, luminosity is radius squared temperature to the fourth. If you get the temperature wrong, you'll get the radius wrong. And so the models tend to fit way too hot. As a result, they tend to produce too small a radius. This is a more modern um, model fit by Alex Madurowitz, who's a graduate student finishing up at Stanford. Um, it, its effective temperature is actually closer to 600 Kelvin. It does a pretty good job of fitting these, including now a radius of about 1.4 Jupiter radius. What's different from it in the previous model? It has different chemistry. It assume, doesn't assume the planet is in chemical equilibrium. It allows for circulation in the planet's atmosphere that effectively destroys methane and brings carbon monoxide up where you can see it. And it actually has extra dust. Um, on top of this planet, in addition to the clouds, there's a layer of, yeah, maybe of tau of a few percent kind of, um, um, of um, dust particles at the top of the planet's atmosphere. Why would there be dust particles at the top of the planet's atmosphere? Well, every one of these systems we look at that's young, um, every system that hosts a planet, has some amount of excess um, uh, of emission associated with excess dust, these debris disks. In our solar system, 
we know you put dust into giant planets. It happens episodically for Jupiter, for example. This is Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 after it got broken up into pieces. This is what it did to Jupiter. It produced marks on Jupiter that covered a not insignificant fraction of its surface. Not a huge amount. Um, Jupiter, we now think, gets whacked by a comet every few years. We mostly miss the collisions and see, the, and see secondary evidence of them afterwards, but between every few years and every decade. I may have mentioned earlier, these solar systems have 10 to the 4 times as much dust as our solar system does, which implies collisions, at least comet to comet, are happening 10 to the 4 times more often. So it's not impossible that these planets get whacked by a comet every week, or possibly every day. Probably, though, to make that model I just showed you, it needs to get whacked by something like the moon every month, which is probably not occurring. So it's hard to get enough dust on these, but it could well be a factor in the, the planet properties. A um, couple of other science things. We can measure metallicities. They're consistent with the trend for our solar system and the Doppler planets. In that, every planet we measure has a sun-like metallicity, and they're also high mass. So I don't think I count that as measuring a correlation. We can measure their orbits. We put a huge amount of work into calibrating GPI's astrometry exquisitely well, piggybacking off Keck, which has exquisitely well calibrated astrometry by Andrea Gez's group. Combined with observations from Gaia and Hipparchos, you can both measure the planet's orbit very accurately and begin to constrain its mass by looking at the reflex astrometric motion of the primary star. Um, that has been demonstrated for some planets. For 51 Airy, when you do that, the mass you get is actually minus two Jupiter masses, which again, equation of state of hydrogen, probably non-physical, so there's really an upper limit on its mass, but this is getting better and better as Gaia and um, Hipparchus astrometry improves and as instruments like KPEG get velocities of the planets um, themselves too. So final science goal I said was interrogating demographics. Jean-Baptiste Ruffio calculated our sensitivity, again, these contrast units versus angular separation. They'll depend on how bright the star is. If a star is really bright, you can see fainter companions. Um, if it, uh, you can see companions at a higher flux ratio, ex better flux ratio, excuse me. If a star is really faint, the system kind of struggles. You don't do as well. So these are contrast curves for a variety of star brightness. And then Eric Nielsen can take a contrast curve and turn it into a completeness, a probability that would you, you would see a planet. So this graph is saying, for example, if there's a 10 Jupiter mass planet at 20 AU, you've got like a 95% chance of seeing it. No matter where it is relative to the star, it's almost certain to be detected. If you have a two Jupiter mass planet at 30 AU, you only see it if it's at its maximum elongation from the star, so you have a relatively low probability of, of successfully detecting it. And then we take all of those completenesses, and if we want to understand the survey, we add them together. So this is the sum of the completeness on all of the targets. Um, Eric. Um, who no longer works for me, so I can't fire him, calls it a tongue plot. Um, I call it a depth of search, but it's basically an a expression of how sensitive the entire survey is to planets averaged over all the stars. It's the sum of the completeness rather than the average, because I find that easier to visualize. And so essentially that's saying that around 300 stars, we could detect something in this kind of 20 Jupiter mass, 30 AU range, down where 51, um, 51 Airy lives, only around 16 stars could we have seen a 51 Airy. Really, it's around 30 stars, but with 50% completeness. Effectively, it's the same as 16 stars. Um, and so you can use these, even just by eye, to infer something about this distribution. There's kind of as many planets down here as there are up here. We could only see these around the youngest stars on the night when the seeing was good. These guys you could see all the time. And so you could tell these planets are much more common than these planets. On the other hand, here, sensitivity doesn't change much, so these objects are probably about as common as these objects. And so we take that and we try to do something statistical. Um, one thing we did was split the sample by stellar mass, and essentially every planet we saw was in something above one and a half solar masses. Every higher mass object, every brown dwarf we saw, was in something below one and a half solar masses. So these giant planets on wide orbits seem more common around high mass stars. Brown dwarf-like objects seem more common around sun-like stars, although that's a weak statistical significance. We can connect these to Doppler surveys. This is an old figure, and so it doesn't reflect the, the state of the artwork by B.J. Fulton on, um, on Doppler survey completeness. But broadly speaking, the GPI distribution, which is shown by this, these are individual draws from all of the distributions of planets that are allowed by GPI statistics. These are individual draws from all of the distributions of planets that are allowed by Doppler statistics. 
they broadly connect in a way that's consistent with the idea that the peak of the giant planet distribution is at a few AU for sun-like stars, somewhat further out and somewhat more massive probably for um, higher mass stars, which are of course hard for Doppler to, to interrogate. Um, uh, and we can see that the distribution of brown dwarfs and, and planets are fairly distinct, consistent, in, um, inconsistent with the idea that they form through the same mechanism. <coughs> Excuse me. So the last 10 or 15 minutes, want to talk about G phi 2. So I did say our early model said we'd find 30 planets, we find six. Why is that? Three reasons. Planets are rarer than those simulations predict, used as an assumption. That's why we built the instrument, to measure it. We've, we made assumptions that, giant planets can, that the giant planet distribution didn't roll over at 5 AU, but kept going. You know, that wasn't even a defensible assumption in 2005, but, but we made it. Planets are a little fainter in H-band than we thought they would be due to details of their atmosphere. And then GPI did underperform compared to the instruments. It was designed to be um, about 100 times more sensitive than Keck. In the end, it's more like 10 times more sensitive also because Keck got better, but, but lower than we thought. Why would that be? Well, we have all this data. We can try to figure that out. We have thousands of images. We have metadata, combined data sets. And so we did empirical fits to understand what's limiting our performance. And we used some physics that we thought we understood. The single biggest performance of prediction turns out to be something called tau. So tau naught is a measure of the it's like seeing in time. It's a measure of how fast atmospheric turbulence is changing. So we often express atmospheric turbulence in terms of something called R0. How many people have heard of R0 for atmospheric turbulence? Most people, good. So how many people picture it in their head as being a blob of air that's R0 across? Right. Um, that's almost completely a lie. It doesn't really consist of blobs of air that are R0 across, but it's a good lie to to comfort you, and it helps you understand because there's a blob of air that's R0 across. The airy PSF is kind of lambed over R0 in size. Tau0 is basically how long it takes the wind to blow by an R0. So it has units of time. The faster the wind is, the smaller the number is. There we go. So there's a, there's a movement by a Tau0. Technically, it's 0.3 R0 over V wind for scaling reasons. Still sort of a lie, but it's a measure of how rapidly the, the atmospheric seeing is actually progressing. Why does that matter? GPI's AO system runs at a kilohertz, so it's measuring the atmospheric turbulence every millisecond. Then it does some math, and then it applies that to the deformable mirror, so it's always late, which I can sympathize with as a parent of a child and a person in an administrative role. Um, you know, one millisecond, here's where the turbulence is now, here's where it is one millisecond in the past, and you can obviously see the enormous difference between these two. If I subtract them, you actually can see the enormous difference between these two, that being a millisecond late leaves you residual atmospheric turbulence that you haven't corrected. And then if I take that residual atmospheric turbulence and turn it into a PSF image, say the wind is at 10 meters per second and I'm two milliseconds late, it scatters a little bit of light, if the wind, on the other hand, is at 40 meters per second and I'm two milliseconds late, it scatters a huge amount of light away from the star. This is Gemini seeing data on tau naught, which typically is around a millisecond. This is what we were told it was before we put the instrument in Chile, which was about five milliseconds. So the seeing is substantially faster than we thought it would be. Why would that be? It's not the winds at Serapachan. These are surface winds in the Serapachan environment. But it's the jet stream. Jet stream goes right overhead on Serapachan on a lot of nights. The jet stream is moving at hundreds of miles an hour. Not a lot of turbulence in it compared to the surface, but it's really fast. And in fact, Alex Madurowitz did a nice paper where he showed that the GPI PSFs, the pattern of scattered light, lines up with the jet stream hour by hour, night after night after night. Other factors, including noise in the wavefront sensor, dome seeing, which is terrible at Gemini, and I can talk about that with drinks later. Um, we took all this information and used it to design GPI's successor, GPI-2. Um, the plan is to move it from Gemini South to Gemini North in Hawaii, which means we need a new logo instead of an adorable fox. We have an adorable nene. Um, and the opportunity to do a whole new survey and to rebuild the instrument in the process. So the upgrade is actually being led by Jeff Chilcote at Notre Dame, Quincona Pack at UC San Diego, with people from Stanford, now Santa Cruz, Cornell, and the Hertzberg Institute, driven by two updated science cases, which I'll talk about, funded by NSF and Heising-Simons. The goal was to get it on the telescope in 2022. 
spoilers didn't happen. You may have heard about the pandemic. I'll talk about the schedule at the end. There's several goals. One of them is to look for planets that are fainter. So we only saw six planets. That could mean planets are rare. It could mean planets are fainter than our models say. Like I said, how much energy you get in a planet depends on the details of its formation. Without talking about it in detail, it's possible when planets form, they form colder. That Jupiter lost energy in the first million years of its formation, making it cold for the rest of its life. In which case, for the handful of planets we found, there's a sort of iceberg's worth of planets that formed through a process that lost a lot of their initial energy and entropy. We refer to these as cold start planets. And this is a contrast separation diagram. Now contrast is in magnitudes because one of the astronomers made it, um, showing a bunch of GPI sensitivity curves. The planets that are in red are planets that formed in this high entropy state. And that's kind of all that GPI would find in its initial survey. There could be a lot of low entropy planets lurking down there waiting to be discovered. If GPI 2 could get to sensitivities that are about a factor of 10 better, could potentially find half a dozen other planets in, in ways that would tell us something about their initial conditions. Another thing, if you look at this diagram, as I said, these are the youngest stars GPI looked at. But notice they kind of stop at F stars. That's because of the magnitude limit. Um, at ninth magnitude, we can't observe G stars at 100 parsecs. These are kind of 10 million year old stars in the Scosen region, which formed a lot of massive stars. Two to one to five million year old stars are in star forming regions like Taurus and Ophiuchus, too faint for GPI in its current state. Um, and so we're upgrading GPI to work at a much fainter magnitude limit, probably about 13th magnitude, which will open up a large sample of stars that are probably forming planets even now. You know, this is the competition with HRD 799 for the most spectacular exoplanet image. It's a system called PDS-70. There's a planet here and a planet here. This is an ALMA image showing that this planet here has a disk around it that's either still forming the planet or forming moons. This target is too faint for GPI. We were not designed to observe stars this young. It will not be too faint for GPI-2. And there's a bunch of stars this young that, that have not yet been observed because they're northern hemisphere, not observed at this sensitivity level. We have other science cases like solar system science, Europa and Enceladus. Um, plumes could potentially be detectable by GPI-2 data. I don't think I'll go through why, because it's still running low on time. We would like to look at, at other things. So we've carried out surveys about doing polarimetry of AGN. Hard, but not impossible, again, if we can get to 13th or 14th magnitude. To do that, what are we changing? There's GPI now. We are getting a better coronagraph, a much better wavefront sensor to let us observe much fainter stars. We're improving the spectrograph. We're enhancing the software. And we're trying to make the instrument really reliable so that it can do, for example, time, time domain projects so that the Gemini staff can look at something and do a target every five or 10 minutes if they wanted to, or do twilight targets for monitoring the plumes on Enceladus or the weather on Titan. Again, happy to talk about that offline. Because it's running much faster, here's the spray of light problem for jet stream conditions for GPI-1, which takes about two milliseconds to make a correction. GPI-2 will update its deformable mirror about eight milliseconds after measurements, much controlling the spray of light. And uh, Mauna Kea has a better sight than Sarah Pashan. It doesn't get the jet stream all the time. So the contrast might well be a factor of 10 better on bright stars. Meanwhile, on faint stars, Current G, this is star magnitude versus Strel ratio as a measure of performance. Current GPI, it can do ninth magnitude for anybody. It could do 10th magnitude if I'm in the room holding its hand personally. GPI 2 is expected to deliver reliable performance down to 13th or 14th magnitude. So opening up those young stars, opening up a handful of AGN. To do that, we're using a pyramid sensor with an EMCCD being built by the group at San Diego based on design work by HAA. Skip over the design, but the coronagraph is also upgraded. GPI-1 uses appetizers, these sort of donut-shaped patterns that kind of suppress diffraction from the telescope. They were designed almost by hand, analytically writing down what that appetization function is by Remy Sumer um, in 2000, almost in the 20th century. 21st century, we have computers. And so we ask a computer what's the best design to suppress diffraction for GPI-2, and it says this which includes structures to block out defects in the deformable mirror. It knows about the spiders in the telescope. It should improve the inner working angle by almost a factor of two and the throughput by about 50% or so. This is mostly work by Emil Poor at Space Telescope, still with Remy. Better prisms for better spectra, including a broadband image mode that gets all of YJH and K, as well as a, a narrowband mode 
um, uh, as well as a um, medium resolution mode around RF 50 or so. Schedule um, and status of the instrument. So it's Gemini. We're still negotiating with them because they're a very litigious organization. So we're, we're finishing a plan for guaranteed time, but we're rebuilding the instrument. So the plan had been to rebuild it in 2020, A, pandemic, B, we shipped it down to Gemini in these beautiful shipping containers full of shock sensors and air cushioning that were basically indestructible. Um, GPI survived and got there, and then Gemini destroyed the containers. Um, and so they had to rebuild the shipping containers from the ground up, hard to do during a pandemic. And so we got GPI back two years later than we thought we would. It arrived in um, Notre Dame a couple of months ago. Based on that and also other pandemic associated component delays, we anticipate first light in early 2024 when there's still going to be a compelling um, um, science role for the instrument. And it'll be nicely complementary. Keck is going to have stunningly good ability to do high resolution spectroscopy and medium resolution spectroscopy for detailed characterization of objects. GPI is designed for surveys. So in principle, we'll find the planets and then we'll hand them off to to Dimitri et al. and now me, because I have Keck access again, um, to characterize. So I'm actually going to hit five, 450, which I'm pretty happy about. Um, I could add an extra slide to make me not hit 450 if people want to talk about JWST. But conclusions, direct imaging, what have we learned? The biggest one is wide orbit. Andrew just left, so I can't talk about occurrence rates compared to Doppler. But wide orbit giant exoplanets are relatively rare. And they're rare and they're hard to look for. They're not that much rarer than hot Jupiters, for example. In fact, they're more common than hot Jupiters. The difference is there's only about 200 stars that I can see a young wide orbit um, giant planet around, whereas you can see a hot Jupiter around thousands of stars or with transits around hundreds of thousands of stars. So, so they're, but they're rare-ish. The total number of, of Jupiter mass and above planets around sun-like stars is probably um, 0.25, about 25% of stars might have a Jupiter mass or above planet. Um, but they're scientifically important. They probe planet formation conditions. Yeah, they're rare, but they're distinct from brown dwarfs. Um, and we've learned things about their atmosphere. In the near future, we'll have GPI-2, designed for a broader science reach, higher performance, efficient survey and monitoring. We want to image very young target systems. We want to image low luminosity planets, approaching solar system levels of sensitivity. Also in the near future, JWST is amazing for this, and so that's the extra slide I have from some early release um, JWST science results. Moderate future, lots of high resolution spectroscopy of these planets and beginning to do the same thing with the ELTs. And then the 2040s, the decadal survey recommended that the next thing we should do should be something like this in space for, for Earth-like planets, a great observatory capability that will get down to, to doing this survey. Models say it will find 25 planets, which is worryingly close to the 30 that I thought I would find with GPI. But part of the point was, all right, we said 30, we got six. If you say 25 for your great observatory and you get six Earths, you're actually still kind of happy, all things considered. So, so we're designing enough margin into these instruments to, to allow it. So I will stop there to allow some question time um, and or someone can say, hey, what about JWST? And I'll show them a slide. So thank you all very much. So Jesse's question is, what kind of planet would I be most excited to find with GPI-2? And I would actually be really excited to find a couple more 51 areas, so to find lower mass cooler planets rather than the very young ones. So it'd be nice to find something. 51 areas, probably about 600 Kelvin real effective temperature. It'd be nice to find a 500 or even a 400 Kelvin planet that we could measure the spectrum of, or a 7 or 800 to, fill, to figure out when you transition from L to T type in a, in a planet. So that's my personal one. Other people in the collaboration would love to find another PDS-70 that's doing protoplanety things, and that would also be very exciting. Or the other other would be multi-planets. So I don't know if you know um, Dan Fabriki, who's a planet dynamicist at University of Chicago. He was on our science team, and I promised him we'd find a multi-planet system so he could do dynamics. And he doesn't answer my phone calls anymore. So if we could find a, a he does, because he's really nice. If we could find another multi-planet system like HRD 799 that we could use the ability to use planet planet stability arguments to say something about the mass and coformation. So those are kind of the three. I like spectra best, so the 51 area, but, but I'd be happy with some of the others. <laughs>
Andrew? Um, actually, I haven't run the simulation. That's an interesting question. Oh, the, so the question was, what are the current observational limits on other planets in the 51 Airy system, and how much better could we do with GPI-2? Um, let me see if I have a 51 Airy completeness curve in my um, Eric completeness sample up here. Uh, not quite 51 Airy, OK. I don't, have, I don't have its contrast curve pulled out, um, but you know, there's the whole survey one. And 51 area is kind of this four star, this line roughly equivalent to the four star line. So, you know, we could see Jupiter mass and a half at wide separations. We could see a 51 area analog at about three AU. Probably that's dynamically excluded anyway. So, um, you know, I, I, think in, I think inside of it, there's no planet we could see that probably wouldn't have messed up the dynamics. At wide separations, actually, that makes a great JWST project um, to look for a half Jupiter mass thing at, at 100 or 200 AU. Um, Two weeks from now. Good. Um, say hello to my star for me. Um, very cool. Um, Well, this is a 50-minute talk, but yes. Yeah, so I didn't mention it even in the slides of the future. Um, uh, I saw a sign coming in that you're not allowed to drink in this auditorium, and it's challenging for me to discuss Roman CGI without drinking. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar with it, the Roman Space Telescope, the 2.4-meter repurposed spy satellite to do dark energy and microlensing, is going to carry a coronagraph called CGI, a prototype coronagraph instrument. And it is going to be a technological marvel. It will be our first chance to do real, it'll look like the chronographs that Dimitri has in his lab or that, that we have in GPI. It'll have deformable mirrors, it'll have modern chronograph masks. Um, but it was not the mission of Roman to do coronography. It's, it was added onto it as a potential capability and every time Roman bumped towards its cost cap, it was de-scoped. And so it's essentially a technology demonstrator. So it is likely, if it achieves the performance the simulations say it will, it will be able to image two or three radial velocity planets and maybe get spectra of a couple of them. It's an interesting demonstration, Lee, but not a large sample. It actually can do very nicely on um, a couple of these younger planets. And I probably should have put a slide in that because there's a, a post back student, Arlene Alleman, in my group who's been looking at this. So you can probably get very nice metallicity measurements on a couple of the known self-luminous planets. And it will do beautiful disk science. Again, I'm not a disk science person. So the, the, the main roles of Roman will be just demonstrate the technology works, which has a huge amount of value. Look at disks and including solar system analog disks, zodiacal disks, um, and then a handful of planets, but if you have big hands. Um. Ah, good question. Um, yeah, so the question was, when we look at Jupiter, it has bands. Um, uh, can we learn things about, you know, is there any possibility of, of studying those bands? I cut my talk down so brutally because I wanted to finish, which I'm sure you're all grateful for, that I removed a number of figures that I cannot quickly find. But in addition to bands, um, Jupiter has hot spots also that you can see at near infrared wavelengths rotating in and out. So there's two directions in which you could potentially um, gain that. On the planet as a whole, I didn't mention that, but another reason this model does fairly well is it has holes in the cloud deck. So in this planet's model, about 10% of the planet doesn't have clouds and you see down to the hotter interior, but with more molecular absorption. And the adding that 10% actually helped a lot with the, the FET. And then the second hope particularly if there's spots, is time domain, that you could look for photometric variations as spots rotate in and out. That's really hard. We do see that in brown dwarfs, of course, but for you kind of need 1% level photometry. We're not currently doing 1% photometry, but that is a GPI-2 goal that I didn't have time to talk about, improving our calibration to the point where on the brightest planets, 
we could potentially do 1% photometry and see variability. Right now, the upper limits are 5 to 10% on that kind of variability, and it hasn't been seen on the planet. But 1% might get interesting. So yeah, I used to, when I gave this talk, actually showed a picture of Jupiter in the infrared with those bands and said, oh, partial clouds. So thank you for, for asking that. Yeah, okay. Um, so, James Webb Space Telescope. This is from an early release science paper by Aaron Carter and Sasha Hinckley, who led the early release science collaboration with 87 other people, including both of us, um, on the paper. This is a known planetary system um, that was discovered by Sphere, not by GPI. And these are the raw James Webb coronagraph images, which are very complicated because of the details of the James Webb coronagraph, optical performance, and so on. Either there's no planets or there's 30 planets in them, um, depending on how you look at it. JWST's raw sensitivity is only kind of OK. But what it has is this exquisite stability. So you can look at a star and then look at a reference star and subtract one image from another. You do, you're cleverer than that, but that's the basic idea you should have in your head when you do it. And so these are images that have done that reference star PSF subtraction plus a little bit of telescope differential roll at 3.5 microns and at 11 microns, and the planet just beautifully um, pops out. It was not a hard planet. They picked an easy one on purpose. Um, they're going to look at a hard one, it sounds like, in two weeks, and it will be interesting to see what pops out, but I bet the hard planet is going to pop out too. In terms of sensitivity for discovery, for the young medium distance stars from the same paper, this is the equivalent of that tongue plot. This is the probability of detection of a planet as a function of mass and semi-major axis for, I want to say, a 30 million year old star might be a 100 million year old star as a function of separation. And it can get down below a Jupiter. It can get down to Saturn masses, which is amazing, albeit only at fairly large angular separation. So Saturn's at 300. And then meanwhile, the GPI sensitivity space doesn't really get below one but it does routinely get inside 10 AU. So GPI is still going to be able to see objects in here. JWST is going to see objects at larger separations. There are some targets for which JWST can see close in, but we've learned the hard way. The occurrence rate of planets is sufficiently low, that, and the number of targets for which, which are close enough that you can see close in is relatively rare. We'll see what happens. So I think there's still a, a survey and discovery role characterization, especially photometrically, JWST is going to do, do swimmingly at. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see the 51 area spectra, or photom photometry first, right? Chaz is nodding, um, uh, as well as the spectra. So I still think there is a survey role, but it's definitely part of the landscape we have to think about. JWST has done beautifully at this, and as was demonstrated in this very nice paper by Aaron and others. About 100, we, basically an hour a star was a reasonable sweet spot. And one of the lessons we learned from the GPI survey, um, if I go back to my completeness m movie, uh, is this recorded streaming or just streaming? Streaming. Um, streaming, 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 good. The odds that anyone from Gemini is listening is relatively low um, under those circumstances. Um, you know, this is the increasing power of the survey over the survey in the order that we observed them. And what you're going to notice is diminishing returns. The first 100 stars were really good. Star number 532 added nothing to the survey. It was old and far away. It's, so we can do a survey as powerful as the original GPI survey by targeting about 100 stars. That'll be about 100 hours. And then Taurus and Ophiuchus, there's probably only 50 really good stars that aren't binaries, have interesting disk geometry. So we're negotiating right now for something on the order of 150 hours for the, the survey. Oh, for web. Um, well, 150 hour, right, web. How long does it take per, per target and in web, including acquisition, Chaz? It takes a couple of hours to do a couple of filters, and you know, it's a five hour to do five Yeah, and the cycle one survey proposals didn't do well. Maybe better in cycle two, but you know, 
it's, it is hard to do a large scale survey. So I think that if, that, if that's kind of what you're helping me say, um, that'll remain an important role for the ground-based instruments. And there are also arguments about whether you use Gaia Hipparchos to target beforehand or not. And, and the survey we're doing is looking at known systems and seeing if we can go deeper and see if we find new yeah. ones in those systems. Best way to find a planet is to look where there's already a planet. <laughs> um, so.